wanted to welcome everybody here. It's great to see so many of you um, interested in this topic. Um, for those of you I haven't met or, uh, you know, either today or some other occasion, my name is Tana Marie Rogers. I work at the Point Bay National Estuary Research Reserve um, up there in, in Salma, and I'm the Postal Training Program Coordinator here. I'm involved in this um, workshop today because we've been working with the town and other partners, ton of families on this and planning um, this event. Um, so I am going to be brief this morning because we have a selectman from the town of Falmouth and a county commissioner, Mayor Pat. Good morning and thank you, Tana Murray. It's really good to be here this morning and especially true to see so many, uh, to see so many of you here. I mean, there's nothing like a full house, uh, especially at this hour in the morning. And I know you've made a great commitment to uh, spend the day here and learn. I wish I could stay with you all day but I am actually uh, on my way to drug court. Now, not for me, <laughs> but there's a drug court graduation today at First District Court, and uh, it's a program that some of the uh, those who have been arrested and uh, have placed in custody have options of opting into a, a program, and if they graduate from the program, then uh, they, they really go out into the community, go back to their homes, and so this is the day that they graduate from the drug court. And it's something that the judges of the district court, the district attorneys for the Cape Cod. Anyway, I'm not going to tell you all about drug court because that's not why you're here. But that's why I can't spend the day with you, which I would love to do. I can tell you that uh, for what you're going to learn today, you have come to the right place. New Alchemy, and especially some of its residents in particular, Earl Barnhart and Hildy Menke, you are going to learn from them and from what you see here. Eco toilets are really what uh, helps make New Alchemy what it is. It has branched out into alternatives and they use them every day in their life. And so you will not only learn academically, but you will actually see how they work. Secondly, you've come to the right town. Falmouth is truly a leader in looking at alternatives as options to sewering. And this all came about several years ago when we had, our, uh, we had to develop our comprehensive wastewater management plan, which was a requirement of the state. And the town manager at the time put a group of people together. They were called the Nutrient Management Committee. And they worked very hard with the consultants to develop a draft plan for comprehensive wastewater management, which they did. And when the plan went to the Board of Selectmen, what happened was uh, there were people in the audience and they were saying, well, what's in the plan? We haven't seen it. What does it mean? And then one or two of the selectmen said, well, they hadn't read it. And so that ended that process. So we said that is not going to work. So the selectmen said, we're going to step back. We're going to um, form a different group and they're going to go through that draft review plan and see whether or not it really does meet what the town is looking for. And the most important piece was uh, public outreach and public participation and public involvement. And that's what happened the second time around. And when the, waste, when the uh, Comprehensive Wastewater Management Committee then went to work on the plan, it took them over a year and a half or more to go through it, improve it, make it better. But the best part was they had three public forums, which are actually facilitated uh, by uh, Patrick um, Fitzgerald Fitz, from the Consensus Building Institute. And those forums, when they first started, the first forum had about 50 people. The second forum was probably closer to 100. And by the third forum, there were almost 200 people there to hear about the plan. So I think one of the major lessons that you can take from Falman that we have learned is that public outreach and public participation is just so important in developing your plan and in implementing your plan. And now the Wastewater Management Committee has completed the plan and has gone to the state. And now as part of that plan, we, want, we have been looking at alternatives as a way to avoid sewering. And eco toilets is certainly one of those, a very viable alternative. There are others permeable reactive barriers for one, um, oyster um, as in the, um, in, the, in the watersheds, 
but Falmouth is a leader, and there's a lot to learn here. And I'm so glad that this forum is here, to, is here today, that you are here today, and that you can take away from it what we hope you achieve. So thank you, and I'm glad to see you, and have a good day. I did want to acknowledge a few of the sponsors of this event um, today. You probably would have seen them on the workshop flyer we had it, but I did want to take time to acknowledge them. Some of them will be contributing in the form of presentations, and others not so much. So the Green Center Incorporated for Hilda Mingay and Earl Barnhart, their sponsors, Cape Cod Commission. Well, I'm not sure if Erin um, Jackson is here yet, but she will be here, and they'll be speaking in the afternoon. Um, the Town of Falmouth. Early, and the Laporte Bay Reserve, as well as the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation that we're a part of, and the Laporte Bay Reserve Foundation that we work with. So those are all the sponsors. We just want to acknowledge them and all the planning that went into this. So now we're going to get into the first talk for this morning, and it will be a keynote address that will be given on the topic, Why Eco Toilets? I did want to mention that we had a switch for our keynote speaker. So some of you will may, may have seen the first flyer um, saw George Woodwell um, announced on that flyer, but he had, there was a scheduling um, um, mix-up um, on that on his end with a family issue, and so he was unable to make it. And we had another very accomplished, very um, informed um, presenter who, on this topic who could, who was willing to jump right in, and that's Nick Ashbold. And so, Nick, thank you for stepping in. Um, very quickly to do that, so I just wanted to explain what the difference was. And there is in your in your in your binder or your folder, you will have a, a list of bio sheets for all the presenters, so you can find out a little bit more about their background. But Nick can tell you um, just a little bit about his involvement, how what capacity he's sharing in today, and have that um, cover the topic why eco toilets. Thank you, Nick. So why eco toilets? So many of you are pretty familiar with composting toilets in general, and I'm not going to go through all the ins and outs of different eco toilets. In fact, that's what the rest of the day is going to be doing. And down the corridor, you can really dig in and have a look and feel them and see them. I don't know about actually using them there, but there are other ones around that can be used uh, from that point of view. But I want to really try to set the context. So as you can see, I'm from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, where I was an academic there for 14 years at the university there. I uh, installed and, and worked a lot with uh, a range of composting urine diversion toilets and worked with a group in Sweden over a number of years. And a lot of what I've learned in that area has come from that sort of interaction. I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati. So I'm representing that, the, my university hat today, although I do, as many of you know, work for the US Environmental Protection Agency. But I'm here on, on a sort of personal mission for this presentation. And as a further introduction, just the, uh, this is my toilet in Sydney, it's a dual flush urine diversion, so the urine stream goes through here, the feces and paper gets flushed down the back end of there, uh, and you'll see later on down, what is downstairs to receive that. So that's just a, a conventional urine diversion toilet. Unfortunately, this particular version is no longer in production, uh, but there are other ones that are in production that you'll see here. And the one on the right is, uh, I'll talk more about this later on as well. So this has just been released uh, as of this year in the UK and is, will be available. In fact, uh, just talking to the manufacturer yesterday, they can supply here to the US a 24 volt version. This is called the Propel Air Toilet. So it can be uh, fitted into an existing house and it's under pressure. So you put the lid down and under pressure, paper feces and, and urine gets pushed up to 20 meters away so it can go uphill and downhill so it can easily be laid into a retrofit sort of scenario and it only uses 1.5 liters to flush the toilet so in certain situations that may be useful and I'll talk about those later on but that's just to explain the two graphics. But getting back to why, why bother with eco toilets? So Clearly there are some big trends which many of us are beginning to recognize, climate change being one of them, but demographic change, and in this part of the world you have a, a huge tourist influx, and so you've got a lot more people at certain times of the year and then a lot fewer people. But the climate side of things, just reading through there, clearly you already suffer from uh, king tides, uh, surges that can infiltrate into uh, sewers that may exist already or into stormwater systems, 
It's a major concern. If we're looking more into the future with sea level rise, this is just going to continue. So clearly there's concerns about, well, let's look at systems that are more adaptable to that sort of climatic change. There's a fundamental uh, interest in conserving energy and reducing our energy footprint. Um, and when we think about our urban water systems, we don't tend to think of that as energy in the same thing, but really that's uh, just liquid energy being supplied, all that energy you're pumping out of the ground, treating that water, sending it to your house under high pressure, and then taking it away again. Typically there are pump stations, uh, and then a lot more energy to aerate it and treat it um, before it may be uh, disposed of. I hate to use that word. Um, hence the uh, inverted commas here. We, I've, I'd like us to think more about these are useful residuals for reuse. I'll come back to that theme. So we've got energy actually in the sewer. If, if we looked at all the energy that's uh, across this country in the sewer, uh, it equates to about the equivalent energy, embedded energy, that we get from 14 large coal-fired power stations. There's an enormous amount of energy. In fact, about 7% of the national electricity consumed in this country is for pumping and treating water and wastewater. And that same 7% of electricity could be produced from the organics that we just flushed down the toilet. So there is a lot of energy, and along with that, the residual nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium nutrients that are essential for plant production and food supply. So we need to think a slightly larger picture here. And the last part, which is related to energy, is our greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases, of course, are consumed by using energy that is where we've got coal or gas uh, power stations supplying those electrons. I've also just been involved with a study back in Sydney on greenhouse gases produced during transportation through sewers. Nitrous oxide is released from sewers, which is a, a key greenhouse gas, along with the discharge of the final effluent into coastal environments. So that adds a further greenhouse gas footprint. So there are these are the considerations to take on board. So here in the US, Clean Water Act was a, a landmark change, or watermark change, perhaps a better term to use, uh, of taking concern over issues, and not to belittle uh, this major achievement. However, it was set up in a different world in many ways. It was set up under the concept of waste uh, and it was set up for large municipalities and industries because they were obviously polluting heavily. Um, but it was not set up for household discharges, septic systems and so forth. So it was off the radar for that. And of course, in this part of the world where some 80% of the nutrient load is coming from septic systems, it hasn't helped. So let's now look at our conventional uh, water and wastewater services in the centralized and decentralized mode that we have in this part of the country. Um, just to, as a reminder, so we typically get our water from the uh, ground or surface water supplies. We pump it through a, a water treatment facility that goes to households under pressure. And that is then split or is kept together as sewage, which is, we can think of the black water is what comes from the commode. The gray water is what comes from laundry sinks, your shower, and other uh, waste streams from a household. Those are usually combined to give wastewater, which is then further treated, and the solids end up as biosolids, and liquid ends up as a discharge, be it into uh, subsurface, into a creek, or ocean outfall. <coughs> that, nonetheless, still releases a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus, and nutrients, as well as carbon. And here in this part of the world where there's a great flow through septic systems, absorption trenches, ultimately making its way into the coastal environment. So we're all very familiar with that, so I won't dwell on it, but there's just some of the numbers that I've already mentioned, the amount of electricity that's consumed, the amount of greenhouse gases. And this system <coughs> is not robust to the climate change of tidal surges, of rain events. We get, in, we get surcharge into the sewer that causes then the wastewater to rid be pushed out of the sewers and causing, again, nutrient and pathogen concerns. So the Clean Water Act hasn't really set us up in this part of the world very well. 
And there are many disconnects in how we think about managing wastewater services. And I just put a little photo up here. Some of you may be familiar with this building in Seattle. It's going to be open on Earth Day this year. Um, so here is a demonstration that has composting toilets. <clears throat> Basically, it's a net zero energy and water building. As a commercial enterprise, they're uh, renting out uh, business office space there at the same commercial rates in Seattle as for other buildings. But this building has, produces all its own electricity with PVs or photovoltaics on the roof. Uh, it collects its own rainwater, which is used uh, for all the water services within the building. Um, they treat that with ozone, and that took some change of, um, of the compliance there in the local uh, health regulations. It uses the foam flush type of toilets in the building. So that's just a, a little indication that they're seeing this as the way forward for the future. Okay. <clears throat> so, the, some of the disconnects we have here are who pays for what and when. So the large centralized systems we're used to, you know, governments going out and getting bond money or getting government support to pay for large centralized systems. But for the decentralized systems, we don't have that same sort of thinking or infrastructure. So we don't think of it as a complete package and thinking about who pays and where the decisions are made. Decisions were really made locally for these things, and yet we get them forced down often at the higher level. So we don't have the right sort of management structures typically to help us open up to these alternatives <coughs> that are going to make us a more sustainable future. So what are some of the core elements and how might we get there? <coughs> So one concept is, you know, the whole idea of being able to manage the environment is a sort of misconception. We can't predict or manage tidal surges, storm events. They're going to happen. And yes, we're inducing more climate change, so we're just going to increase these. But we can't manage them per se. So what we need to manage is our systems to be more resilient to these sorts of events. So let's take that message. And now look just back as to where we are at the moment. So this is a report that came out last week from the US EPA and others, which is available on this website, just talking about the rivers and streams across the country, and it's set up into various sectors that's color-coded here. Um, and the take that message really is that about over 55, only 60 percent in this part of the world of our rivers and streams are heavily impacted and they're heavily impacted from the point of nutrients, um, predominantly, and loss of uh, stable biotic indicators, macroinvertebrates in particular. So these are the various indicators that we used in the study, just so you're aware of what they were. And we go more specifically here to this part of the world, which we're more familiar with. <coughs> Again, here was a, a national <coughs> coastal survey done, and whilst these numbers and things are too difficult to read, for sure, red is bad. Okay, uh, it's, uh, you can read what it says there, large deterioration, moderate to high susceptibility, expected increases in nutrient loads. And up here, Cape Cod, Chesapeake Bay, it's one of the worst in the country. So I guess we all know that, but for those who live here, here's some uh, information from Buzzards Bay, which just sort of implies that we think that most of this is coming from our septic systems. Okay, so clearly, current septic systems need to be changed. They need to be changed quickly, and that needs to be thought through as to where it's going to be most effective and how. So let's think now where, why are we producing all this wastewater, and maybe there are alternatives to reduce that loading. So where is water used? So in a household, typically this is a, taken from the American Water Works Association, uh, research foundation, just where is water used in homes, so clothes washing and the force of the shower. Typical toilet uses you know, at least 25, nearly 30 percent of the water, depending on the type of it. We lose about 30 percent of, of the town supply before it even reaches households and so forth. So, thinking about toilets, thinking about clothes washing, we don't really need to use high grade, fully treated drinking water. So why do we? Well, because it's cheap and it's supplied to homes and we've built our infrastructure around that paradigm. So we tend to want to think into the future about what is water fit for purpose? Okay. 
So think about water fit for purpose. We can think about various grades of water that could be reused, treated appropriately for appropriate reuse. And when we think about that, we can come up with a schematic which gives just conceptually some of the elements that we might want to think about. So we can still have a town supply, but we may only need to have about 20% of a conventional supply. So there, we're greatly reducing extraction from the environment and the harm that that may be doing to ecosystem services by pulling that water out. We can top up, particularly in this part of the world, with rainwater. And the great water fraction that is in a conventional sewer, if we think of that, or go into your septic tank, 70% of that, is, of that flow is grey water. And that is the more readily treatable water that could be reused either within the home or within clusters of homes. And if we keep the toilet separate, either have a composting toilet or we take it as a partly flush toilet, we have what's called black water. That stream is the one rich in energy and nutrients that I've already alluded to before. And that could be taken to, at a community scale, an energy recovery station where you turn that organic material uh, residuals, basically to methane, which you, when on demand, can burn and turn into electrons. And the excess heat from that can be recovered, so you have what's called a combined heat and energy sort of plant at this facility. And this is not science fiction, these are currently available, and I'll show you some that are operating in Germany in a minute. So you not only get electricity back into the grid, but you get hot water supply back into the community for 